So today it is uh, a fortunate occasion that Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, is here with us and I learned from uh, Venerable Bhante uh, Simuleji that Venerable uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi is going to be here. So I have been hearing about him and I know him through his translations and works. Uh, for many years. So then um, I re requested that it would be good to utilize the opportunity of his presence over here. And uh, um, and yesterday when we met, he came to see me and uh, he accepted our request. So I'm very glad that you accepted to give a talk here. Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is an American Buddhist monk ordained in Sri Lanka. In 1972, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> and he studied under the esteemed uh, scholar monk Venerable uh, Agama Mahapandita uh, Balam Goda Ananda Maitriya Mahanayak Thera, and uh, with whom he studied Pali and Theravada Buddhism. And uh, prior to his ordination, uh, coming to Sri Lanka, he um, did his PhD uh, in Western philosophy from Claremont Graduate University of uh, California. Uh, and then uh, he was in Sri Lanka for uh, over 20 years, uh, studying over there, and then um, working on different uh, aspects, particularly uh, as editor and the president of uh, Buddhist Publication Society in, in Kandy. So over the years, he has translated many collections of Buddhist uh, uh, Buddha's discourses, including the Majjhima Nikai, Sanyuk Nikai, and Anguttar Nikai. Uh, he now lives in, and teaches in the United States he is also the founder and chair of uh, Buddhist Global Relief, uh, an organization dedicated to, to combating chronic hunger and uh, uh, malnutrition around the world. So we are really happy to have him here. And uh, um, I have been reading his translations. Uh, and uh, when I found uh, when I read his translations, I found it uh, quite uh, uh, comprehensible and uh, easy to read and easy to understand. Whereas, in comparison to that, the earlier translations used to be quite archaic and difficult to understand. First, you have to read the translation itself. And then, after a while, you can understand the meaning behind it. Whereas, uh, uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation is very smooth and uh, clear with a great clarity and a um, very smooth flow. Uh, so I've been reading his articles and uh, translations and wanted to meet him. We uh, were about to s meet in, uh, in, in 2004 when I was uh, going to visit uh, Smith College and give a uh, um, series of lectures over there. Uh, but I couldn't make it due to my visa on the time that, uh, during which he was there. So, but we are happy that uh, we have here Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, a renowned uh, uh, scholar of Pali tradition, as well as a renowned uh, translator of uh, the Pali uh, literature into English language. So, yesterday I requested him to give a talk on uh, dependent origination and uh, selflessness uh, in um, Pali tradition or the Theravada tradition. So now I would like to request you. Please. Yeah, both are fine. Perfect. Yeah. We can have both. Okay, so first I would like to thank the Federal <coughs> Vice Chancellor. Um, Geshe Samden for inviting me to give this talk this afternoon. And also I have to thank my friend, my old friend, 
Venerable Professor Sibeli for bringing me to the Tibetan Institute, where he is an esteemed professor, helping to introduce Pali and the Theravada tradition to this institute. We first met, myself and Venerable Sibeli, back in my first year as a monk in 1973, when I spent the rains retreat at a place in Sri Lanka called Island Hermitage, and Venerable Sibeli was there, and he was the one who first sort of introduced me to the routines at the monastery and helped me in many ways. And now we've met just a few days ago after many, many years not seeing each other. Um, okay, so the talk that I'm going to be giving is on the topic of dependent origination and selflessness. And I think that the integration of these two topics, I know, is extremely important in the Tibetan tradition stemming from the works of Nagarjuna. And what Nagarjuna has done is to bring together dependent origination and selflessness or emptiness into an integral whole and has used dependent origination as the ground for exposing the truth of selflessness or emptiness. That seems to have been <coughs> Nagarjuna's sort of unique and original contribution to the development of Buddhist philosophy. In, I'm most familiar with, of course, with the Nikayas, the Pali Nikayas and the Pali Abhidhamma system. And rather strangely, I don't find in these texts a clear connection between the let's say, a clear, explicit connection between dependent origination and selflessness. But since the Dhamma is always, all of the facets of the Dhamma are always intricately interwoven, we could say that that connection is implicit in the early teachings, but it took maybe generations, <clears throat> even centuries, for that connection to be drawn out and made explicit. What's interesting is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the Prajnaparamita Sutras, of course, are best known for expounding in great detail with many intricate, uh, <coughs> intricate details about the teaching of emptiness. But even the Prajnaparamita Sutras don't show what is the ground or underlying principle behind emptiness. What they do is repeat again and again that form, material form, is empty, feeling, perception, the mental formations, consciousness is empty, or all of the dhammas which are elaborated in the classical Abhidhamma, all of those are said to be empty or to be not different from emptiness. But what is the reason why they are said to be empty? So it was Nagarjuna's contribution is to see that the underlying rationale for emptiness is dependent origination, or pratitya samudpada. In the Pali suttas, as I said, these two teachings are presented somewhat separately, though there are a few places where they come extremely close together, almost touching. So first I'm going to look at each of these teachings sort of separately, beginning with dependent origination. And since I was just invited to give this talk yesterday afternoon, <laughs> no, it's not, nothing to be sorry about, nothing to apologize for. But what I did was to start brainstorming my own brain, and this morning looking through some of the suttas on the internet, and then finding relevant texts. But I didn't have time to sort of organize them into a systematic whole. So this is going to be sort of touching and exploring different bases which maybe we could use as a starting point for some discussion. Okay, so let me start off. I keep all of my notes on this trip in this little notebook. <clears throat> okay, I start off with a passage that occurs in the Mahavaka, this is a book in the Vinaya Bhitaka, the book of discipline, which gives the story of the Venerable Sariputta's encounter 
first encounter with the Dhamma. And, you know, Venerable Sariputta was the foremost or chief disciple of the Buddha, and he became the disciple who was considered most preeminent in Panya or Prajna, in wisdom. Earlier, before he met the Buddha, he was like a wandering ascetic with his friend Moggallana, and they traveled all over India looking for a teacher who could show them the way to the deathless. And after all their travels and inquiries, they came back to Magadha, the state of Magadha, disappointed, not having found the teacher. Then, one day, when Sariputta was on his arms round, he saw an ascetic, a monk, walking very, very peacefully from house to house, collecting alms. And he was very impressed by the demeanor, the calm demeanor of that monk. And that monk, was, his name in Pali is Asaji, and he was one of the first five <coughs> disciples of the Buddha. And so he waited till he found a suitable opportunity. And then he approached Asaji, the Venerable Asaji, and said, your faculties are very calm, your manner is very tranquil. Um, what is the teaching that you follow, and who is your teacher? And then the Venerable As Asaji said, my teacher is the ascetic called Gautama, who went forth from the Sakyan clan, and it's his teaching that I profess. Then Sariputra said, what is his teaching? Tell me. And Asaji said, I'm not very, I've just recently come to his teaching, even though he was already an arhat, but he's very modest. He says, I'm very, I just recently came to his teaching, and I'm not really well versed in it, and I can't explain it in detail. Then Sariputta said, I don't need the details. Please tell me the essence of the teaching, even briefly. And then the Venerable Asaji recited a verse and the verse in translation goes, I, I think I have the, the Pali here, Ye Dhamma He Tu Pabhava Te Sung He Tung Tathagato Aha Yo Cha Te San Cha Niro Do Evang Vadi Mahasamano which means those Dhammas, those phenomena that originate from a cause, the Tathagata, the Buddha, has explained their cause, and also that which is their cessation. That is the doctrine of the great ascetic. And then upon hearing that verse of just four lines, Venerable Sariputta reached the first stage of enlightenment, what is called stream entry. So this verse, in a sense, gives us the essence of dependent origination the essential principle of dependent origination. Not the full elaborate doctrine, but it shows us the essence of dependent origination is that all phenomena originate through causes or conditions, and they depend on those conditions. And with the cessation of those conditions, the phenomena, the dependent phenomena, also cease. <coughs> And this verse became something, we call it like the hallmark of the Dharma. So I believe in various languages, it's inscribed on monuments throughout India. Some in Sanskrit, some in Pali, some in other variant languages. We find that dependent origination is sometimes presented as the discovery that the Buddha, or at that point the Bodhisattva, made on the night of his enlightenment. So when he sat down under the Bodhi tree, after attaining the jhanas and emerging from the jhanas, the meditative absorptions, he begins to investigate. You know, it's not like he knows dependent origination as a fixed doctrine, but he just begins an inquiry, an investigation, starting with the problem that led him into the homeless life. That is the problem of old age and death. So he asks, why is it that we're subject to old age and death? What is the underlying condition for old age and death? And he comes to the realization that the underlying condition is birth. It's because we're born that we grow old, 
and die. And then he continues his line of inquiry. What is the condition for birth? That's existence. What is the condition for existence? Grasping or clinging and so forth until he comes back to avicca, ignorance, as the most fundamental condition for this whole series of terms that defines dependent origination. And then what's interesting, when he discovers ignorance as the most fundamental cause, then there occurs to him, the text says, origination, origination, thus in me there arose the I, the knowledge, the wisdom, the clear understanding, the light. And then the same comes with the series of cessation, of cessation. So what is the way to bring old, and old age and death to an end? There has to be an end to birth. And then taking the line of inquiry back, what is the way to put an end to this whole series of conditions that bring suffering? There has to be an end to ignorance. And so with the cessation of, ig of ignorance, abhijja, the whole series of terms falls down, it's sort of like a falling row of dominoes. Ignorance ceases, the sankara ceases, always when birth ceases, old age and death ceases. And then the thought occurs to him, cessation, cessation, again he says, thus, in me there arose the eye of vision, there arose knowledge, there arose the wisdom, there arose the clear understanding, there arose light. And so this shows that dependent origination was the discovery that the Buddha made on the night of his enlightenment. It was the discovery that brought his enlightenment. And so we find some other texts which say, I think it's Sariputta who says this, that one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma, and one who sees the Dhamma sees <coughs> dependent origination. Okay, to explain the whole series of, de of dependent origination, the twelve-fold series, becomes a very complicated matter, which you know could take a whole, it would really require a sequence or a set of lectures to cover the whole series. But just very, very briefly, just to show the way it's treated in the Pali tradition. So I'm just going to go through very, very quickly. And I mean, if you want to learn the details, there are a number of books which explain in much more detail. Okay, so we start with ignorance, which is usually explained in the suttas as not understanding the Four Noble Truths, or not understanding dependent origination itself, not understanding the three marks of impermanence, suffering, non-self. Because of this ignorance, a person engages in various volitional activities that create karma. Then that ignorance and the volitional activities are what drive consciousness into a new existence. So the consciousness here is the first moment of consciousness that begins the new existence, and then the stream of consciousness that persists through the new life. Once consciousness arises in the new life, it always occurs together with what's called Nama Rupa. Translated literally as name and form, but it means the psychophysical organism that serves as the base or foundation for consciousness. As the psychophysical organism matures, the six sense bases emerge, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and begin functioning. Through the functioning of the six sense bases, one makes contact with objects, the corresponding objects. Out of that contact, 
there arises feeling, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neutral feeling. That feeling serves as the bait or the object of craving. So one craves pleasant feeling, one craves to be free from unpleasant feeling or painful feeling, one develops even a subtle attachment to neutral feeling. Okay, out of craving, when the craving solidifies and intensifies, it becomes clinging. Through that clinging, one engages in a new round of activities, volitional activities, which create the karma capable of fashioning or constructing a new existence. So that is what's meant by bhava, or existence. Okay, then once one has the craving, clinging, and those karmic activities that can create a new existence, this leads to a new birth, and then birth is again followed by or culminates in old age and death. So the way the Pali tradition analyzes what divides these 12 links, I believe this is also the I found this to be also the case in the Madhyamaka Karikas of Nagarjuna, also divides up the twelve links very much the same way as the Pali tradition. So it seems to be part of the shared Buddhist tradition before the division into schools. Okay, so it said that ignorance and volitional activities are ascribed to the previous existence. All of the links from consciousness through existence are assigned to the present existence, and then birth and old age and death are assigned to the future existence. And so when people, especially fairly newcomers to Buddhism, come across this way of dividing dependent origination, they think this doesn't make sense. They <laughs> think, how could it be that Old age and death lie in a future existence, not in this existence. How is it that ignorance existed in the, the pet previous existence, not in this existence? Okay, so the way we have to see these 12, the laying out of the 12 links, I call this a expedient or skillful expository device for showing the causal dynamics that lie behind the process of samsara, of birth and death. But the way the Pali commentators explain dependent origination, they say that these 12 links actually fall into four groups, and in these four groups we have 20 modes. And the way this is done is by saying that whenever there's ignorance and volitional activities, along with them we have craving, clinging, and the karmic activities that create new existence. So we have those five factors, ignorance, volitional activities, craving, clinging, and existence. So those are five factors that are both the causal factors of the past existence leading into the present, and the causal factors of the present leading into the future. Okay, then when we have cut, then we have cut, <coughs> the five factors, consciousness, name and form, six sense bases, contact and feeling. So those are the results, those five are the results in the present, those are the results of the past causes, and in the future, those will be the results of the future results of the present causes. And then what about old age, birth and old age and death? Well, is birth, old age and death are what pertain to the five groups, consciousness, name and form, the six sense bases, contact and feeling. So that is really what is born, what grows old, and what dies. And so we have the four groups, first the causes of the past, ignorance, volitional activities, craving, clinging, and existence, 
the five results in the present consciousness through feeling, then the five causes in the present, craving, clinging, and existence, and along with them, ignorance and the volitional activities, and then the five results in the future, again, consciousness through feeling, and it's those five that include within them birth, old age, and death. So in this way, we have these four groups, and each group has five constituents, so we have 20 modes, 20 factors, all together making up dependent origination. Okay, then, a, a, another thing about dependent origination, again, as I said, I've just collected sutta passages that I could find, so I'm not going in a kind of organized linear structure and presentation. So we find that after the Buddha's enlightenment, when he was sitting in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree, after a long period of meditation, sort of absorbing fully the content of his enlightenment, he was, the question rose in his mind, should I try to teach the Dhamma to others? Then he came to this realization, he realized, this Dhamma that I have penetrated is very deep, difficult to see, difficult to understand, it's subtle, sublime, to be penetrated by the wise. But these ordinary people are foolish, given to lust and hatred. They won't be able to see. He says that there are two things that they won't be able to see. One of them is dependent origination, and the other is Nibbana, which is liberation from dependent origination. So this, this shows, actually, the way I understand it, that this was pretty much the content of the Buddha's enlightenment, the two basic principles that he realized through his enlightenment. One is dependent origination, and then by tracing the chain of conditions back to ignorance and breaking through ignorance, all of the factors, the causal factors, come to an end, and then he attains Nibbana. And so those were the two things that he was hesitant to teach because he was afraid that people would not be able to understand them. But then it happened, as we know, that Brahma Sahampati, one of the high deities, comes down from the Brahma world and appears before the Buddha and pleads with him and says, please, Bhante, there are people with little dust in their eyes who would be able to understand the Dhamma. Please go forth and teach the Dhamma. There are those who will be able to understand. Then the Buddha again looks out at the world with his Buddha vision and sees that beings are like lotus flowers in the lake. Some are just buried deep in the mud, unable to understand. Some are like lotus flowers that are rising through the water. And some are like lotuses that are just on the surface of, of the water and they need only the sunlight to open up. And then the Buddha decides to teach. Okay, so we find also some interesting things said in the suttas about dependent origination. And one of them actually goes closely with a verse in the Mad Madhyamaka Karikas, where Nagarjuna says, that which we call emptiness, dependent origination, the middle way, and it's fire. <laughs> Wait, it's upadaya panyati. That would be the Pali, upadaya prajnyati. Uh, how would you translate this? Dependent description? Okay, so anyway, Nagajana is identifying emptiness, dependent origination, and the middle way in that verse. Okay, we find a base for this in the, even in the Pali Nikayas, except here, 
The Buddha doesn't call dependent origination not the middle way, because the middle way, Majjhima Patipata, is the way of practice. And that's what the Buddha calls the Noble Eightfold Path, is the Majjhima Patipata, the middle way of practice. It's the way that avoids the extremes of sensual indulgence and the extreme of self-mortification. But rather what the Buddha says when he teaches dependent origination, he says, the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma in the middle. He says, Majjena Dhammam Desaiti. So against, even though it's not the middle way, but it's the Dhamma taught in the middle. And the reason it's said to be the Dhamma taught in the middle is because dependent origination avoids the two extremes in which all of the views, the philosophical views that were in circulation in India during that period, and probably even up to the present, all of them fall into these two extremes. The two extremes are eternalism, which posits some kind of eternally existing entity within the person or out in the world, well, in other words, the view that there is like an eternal self or an eternal deity that remains ever the same without change. And the other extreme is the extreme of annihilationism, the extreme that holds that the person exists temporarily between birth and death, and with the event of death, everything comes to an end, everything vanishes. So what dependent origination teaches is that all of these phenomena that constitute sentient existence arise dependently, dependent on causes and conditions, and when those causes and conditions cease, then the dependent <coughs> ceases. And there's a sutta, and I think this is one of the few early suttas that Nagarjuna actually quotes in the Madhyamaka Karika. In the Pali version, it's called the Kachana Gota Sutta. It's Samyutta Nikaya, it's chapter 12, sutta number 15. Yeah, in this sutta, a monk named Kachana Gota comes to the Buddha and says, right view is spoken about. So we always speak about samaditi, right view. How does one hold right view? And then the Buddha says, the world, for the most part, depends upon two extremes. Or the world depends upon dvaya, depends upon a duality, a dyad. So one of these extremes is the extreme of the idea of existence. And the other extreme is that of non-existence. And then the Buddha says that the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma by the middle way. And then he goes on to say that for one who sees the origination of the world as it really is, there is no holding to the view of non-existence in regard to the world. Because when you see the origination of the world through dependent origination, one realizes that as long as ignorance and craving have not been eradicated, there's always going to be a renewal of existence. And with the renewal of existence, of becoming, a world will become manifest and will be immersed in the experience of the world. So as long as as long as one has not seen, when one sees the origination of the world as it really is, then there is no view of non-existence in regard to the world. That is, one can't hold to the view of annihilation, because one sees that these causes and conditions, ignorance, craving and clinging, are what regenerate, what produce again and again the cycle of existence. And then he says, on the other side, when one sees the cessation of the world as it really is, then one is unable to hold to the view of existence in regard to the world. That is, when one sees the cessation of all of the phenomena that constitute our body and mind, 
then one is unable to hold to the idea of some kind of permanent self or some kind of permanent deity, created deity, <coughs> in regard to the world. Okay, so this is how the Buddha shows or explains that dependent origination as the middle teaching, which avoids the extreme. Here he says it avoids the extreme of existence and non-existence. There are some other suttas, again in the same chapter, where the Buddha says that dependent origination is the middle doctrine because it avoids the extremes of eternalism and annihilationism, the extreme of unity and the or of oneness of everything, and the extreme of diversity, of pluralism, that there's an ultimate diversity amongst things. The Buddha also presents dependent origination. It's a, an interesting set of suttas where he says, I will teach you the origin and passing away of the world. And then he says, what is the origin of the world? So he starts off with the eye and form. So when dependent on the eye and forms, there arises eye consciousness, and visual consciousness the coming together of consciousness with the object through the eye, that is contact. With contact as condition, there's feeling. With feeling as condition, there's craving, clinging, and so forth through birth, old age, and death. That is the origination of the world. So this shows, in a way, like the Buddhist perspective on the world. Usually we think that there's an objective world existing out here, and that we are just sort of chance people who have somehow sprung up within this objectively existing world. But in the Buddha's presentation of dependent origination, the world exists because we, situated in the world, through our six sense bases, make contact with the six corresponding objects and that contact generates feeling, craving, and clinging, and that projects consciousness into a new existence which brings forth the world present to consciousness. Okay, so these are just some aspects of dependent origination in the early <coughs> teachings. Okay, now I'll turn to the other side of my talk, and that is the teaching on selflessness or non-self. And probably the most basic text for the teaching of non-self is one that was first taught right here in this, <laughs> well, near the city of Sanat in the Deer Park, which was the second formal discourse of the Buddha, the discourse on non-self, the Anatta Lakana Sutta. In that discourse, the Buddha lays down there, like there are two, I say, two arguments, two separate arguments for the principle of anatta, non-self. So the first argument, it proceeds in the form of a question and answer dialogue between the Buddha and the first five monks. So he asks, or he, he says that this body, this physical form, leads to affliction, that we don't have control over this physical form, so that we could say, let my form be thus, say I want to be always young, healthy, to be alive, not to die, I want to be beautiful, successful, and so on, so I don't have that mastery or control over form, and so then the Buddha says, because form, physical form, leads to affliction, therefore, physical form is not self. And then the same argument is presented with regard to the other four aggregates, feeling. I can't always feel the extreme, blissful, pleasant feeling, but inevitably I undergo painful and miserable feelings. Perception, I can't, the, the aggregate of perception, I can't always perceive everything that I want to see. I want to see a perfectly clean city of Varanasi. 
no garbage on the ground, no vehicles spewing out the gas exhaust. But I don't get to see that because I can't control my perception. The volitional activities, again, I don't have mastery over them. I have some degree of control, but not absolute mastery. And consciousness, the fifth aggregate. We don't have mastery over them so that I can determine just by an act of will that my feeling, perception, volitions, consciousness accord with my desire. And so that lack of absolute control, lack of mastery, shows that the five aggregates are not self. Because what's implicit here is the idea that if something is the self or something belongs to the self, we should be able to control it absolutely through our act of will. And so what I can't control, that is held to be non-self. It would be interesting to do an inquiry, and I haven't been able to do this, into what would be maybe the Vedic or Upanishadic underpinnings of this conception of the self, the connection of the idea of self with that of mastery or control. Okay, the second argument that we find in the discourse on non-self is in terms of the three characteristics. So the Buddha begins by questioning amongst what do you think is bodily form permanent or impermanent? Then the answer, it's impermanent. Is what is impermanent pleasant or pleasurable or painful? Sukha or dukkha? It's dukkha. It's unsatisfactory, deficient, defective. Then the Buddha says, is what is impermanent and is it fitting to take what is impermanent, subject to suffering, <coughs> subject to change, to take that to be oneself? And then the answer comes, no, it's not fitting. And so the Buddha says, therefore, whatever visible, uh, physical form there is, whatever feeling, perception, whatever volitional activities, whatever consciousness there is, all of that should be seen as it really is with samapanyaya, with correct wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And then from this the Buddha continues, therefore seeing in such a way, seeing these five aggregates as not self, the instructed or learned noble disciple becomes disillusioned or disenchanted with form, feeling, perception, volitions, consciousness. Through that disenchantment, he becomes dispassionate towards them. Viraga sets in. And then through viraga comes vimuti, liberation. Okay, so those are the two basic arguments for non-self. One is the argument from the fact that the five aggregates are subject to affliction, that we don't have absolute control over them. The second argument proceeds from impermanence to dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, to the selfless nature of the five aggregates. Yeah, there is... An interesting sutta with similes for the five aggregates which show the correlation or connection between the, I call it the classical teaching or the archaic teaching of non-self and the teaching on emptiness that's going to emerge in Buddhism. And this is in this Samyutta Nikaya chapter 22, it's sutta number 95. The name of the sutta is the lump of foam. Yeah. In this sutta, the Buddha, together with the monks, they're staying on the banks of the river Ganges. And then as they're sitting there, a lump of foam comes drifting down the river. And then the Buddha points to the monks, he points out that lump of foam. He says, do you see that lump of foam? And the monks say, yes. And then he says, that lump of foam, when you, we look at it from a distance, it looks so solid and substantial. You know, it looks like a 
big mass of stone is coming down the river. But if you come close to that lump of foam, if you take a stick and you hit it, you see that it's just foam which will collapse. So it, when you examine it close up, it appears to be empty, to be hollow, to be insubstantial or coreless, a sarika, without any sara, without any inner core. And so the Buddha says, in the same way, this material form, which seems to be so solid and substantial, when you look at it with wisdom, you see that it's hollow, empty, coreless, insubstantial. And I find that to be quite interesting when you compare the Buddha's statement so many 2,500 years ago with what modern physics tells us about the constitution of matter. You know, this table seems to be so hard and solid. If I try to put my hand through it, I meet with this resistance. But if we have like a super microscope and we look at it, we see it's made up of molecules. Those molecules are made up of atoms. And we look into the atoms and we see that maybe the nucleus is like a football in the middle of a football field. The <coughs> electrons are like a few spectators in the stands. And the rest is just empty space. Okay, so that's with regard to physical, to, to matter, material form. In regard to feeling, the Buddha uses the example of in the rainy season, there'll be a pool of water and then it's raining heavily, and on the surface of the water, bubbles appear. And each bubble, when it pops up, it appears like a sphere of crystal. But as soon as the bubble pops up, it immediately bursts, and we see that all along the bubble is empty. And so the Buddha says, in the same way, feelings like when you're feeling pleasure, you're feeling pain, it seems to be something enduring, something substantial. But when you look closely into feeling and see that feeling is just a momentary event, each feeling occurs in a split second and then it's gone. It bursts like the bubble. And then perception, the Buddha uses the example of a mirage that appears in the summertime. I update this to modern times when we're driving during a hot, sunny day along a road. Often we see what looks like a pool of water on the road ahead of us. When I was a kid driving with my parents, riding in the car with my parents, I, when I used to see that, I thought, uh-oh, we're heading into a pool of water. But when we arrive at that spot, there's no water there. It's just an illusion created by I guess the refraction of the light. So the Buddha says in the same way, perception is a mirage. We see things as being real, solid, substantial, existing in their own right. But when you examine them with wisdom, we see how perception is deceiving us. Okay, then for the volitional activities, the sankharas, the Buddha uses the example of a man who wants to build something with hardwood, solid wood, and he goes into the woods and he sees a banana tree. It's a big, strong-looking banana tree. So he thinks, ah, I can get some hardwood from that banana tree. So he cuts it down at the root, and then he thinks, I'll peel it, and then by peeling off these layers, finally I'll get to the hardwood. But he peels one layer, another layer, another layer. Finally, when he peels the last layer, there's nothing left. It's just these layers wrapped one around the other. And so the volitional activities are in the same way, just a whole bundle of different volitional formations, but there's nothing solid within them. And then consciousness, consciousness is like the Buddha compares it to a magical illusion. It's like a magician. They say that the Indian magicians were able to do this. I don't know if it's true or not. A magician at the crossroads takes some sticks and grass and little pebbles, puts them out on his table, um, 
waves the wand with the cloth in front of it, <laughs> recites some mantra, then pulls the cloth away, and there's a bunny rabbit. <laughs> and so you're looking at that magical display, and you're thinking, wow, that's amazing, that's incredible. All of the laws of physics now are just thrown out the window. <laughs> But if we have a viewer sort of standing behind the curtain there watching what the magician is doing, he's seeing the magician as he puts that cloth in front of the, um, that stack of grass and sticks. He's reaching with the other hand into his drawer, pulls out a bunny rabbit, puts it there very quickly, and then pulls the cloth away and everybody is awestruck. Okay, so that is consciousness is like in a magical illusion. It, again, it shows us sort of a real substantial world there, but when we look into the nature of consciousness, we see that there's, in fact, the consciousness is what seems to be like the final, let's say the final determinant for the notion of myself. You know, we could say, okay, the body is not self, feeling, perception, the volitional activity is not self, but especially within the strain of Vedantic thought, it's the cheat sat cheat ananda the cheat which is taken to be the Atman, the Self. But for the Buddha, Vijnana is just a process that's arising and passing away, wrongly grasped as being the Self. Okay, I've brought in a few things on Sunyata, but I don't know how I'm doing for time. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just touch some briefly on sunyata, then I wanted to leave some time for questions and discussion. Because sometimes there's an idea that sunyata was somehow an idea completely original to the Prajnaparamita Sutras and then developed philosophically by Nagarjuna. But one can find the, at least the roots or at least the seeds of the idea of sunyata already in the early suttas. And I looked for several suttas that bring forth this idea of sunyata. One is in the Sangyuta Nikaya, again. This is in chapter 35, it's sutta number 85. In this sutta, the Venerable Ananda comes to the Buddha and says that, I've heard you say that the world is empty. The world is empty. In what sense is the world empty? And then the Buddha says, the eye, that's the visible eye, or the, this eye, not the eye is the self, yeah, the, the visual organ. The eye is empty of a self or anything that belongs to the self. Visible forms are empty of the self or anything belonging to the self. The ear, nose, tongue, body, mind is empty of the self or of anything that belongs to a self. And then there are objects, sounds, odors, tastes, tactile objects, mental objects are empty of a self or of anything that belongs to the, to a self. So we see here, like this is a source out of which the idea of sunyata could have developed. And then there's a beautiful chapter in a work called the Sutta Nipata. The chapter is called the Parayana, the way to the far shore, to the further shore. And one of the, in, in that work, the Parayana, there are 16 Brahmins who have heard the reputation of the Buddha and they travel all the ways from the area that now I think would correspond to Telangana, all the ways up to Savati, and then they go on to Rajagaha to see the Buddha, to meet him. And they each have a set of questions that they urgently want to ask the Buddha. And one of these Brahmins is named Mogaraja, and he asked the Buddha, how should one look upon the world so that the king of death does not see one? 
And then the Buddha replies, look upon the world as empty, uproot the wrong view of self. If you look upon the world in such a way, the king of death will not see you. And so here, in this very important and very beautiful text, we have the Buddha recommending looking upon the world as empty, as the way to destroy the wrong view of self and thereby escape the bondage of old age and death. Okay, maybe this will do sort of like a, a basic presentation, and then we could have some time for questions, discussions. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, I'm Chinna Jokar, and I'm studying Buddhist philosophy in Acharya first year. And, um, yeah. and my question is um, about the, out of 12 uh, interdependent Links, yeah. Origination, yeah. Links. Um, the first one, ignorance, we usually say that the root cause of samsara is ignorance. Yeah. So when I think about it, it's easier to think about myself or the self, it's easy. But if I think about the external objects, it's very hard to say that how how is the ignorance becomes the cause of the world. It's very hard to relate. Yeah, so what I would say probably is that it would be not, because of not seeing external things as they really are, the objects of the senses, say, we tend to take things to be mine, to be the property of the self, the belongings of the self, or we see them as pointing to a self. So usually what we grasp as being myself would be our own set of five aggregates, bodily form, feeling, perception, volitions, consciousness, external objects. Of course, I wouldn't, unless I'm mentally deranged, I would not take these glasses. This is myself. This is I. <laughs> but I would say that these glasses are mine in something more than a conventional sense but a kind of attachment, lap, with attachment I latch on to them and take them as things that belong to me. Or even things that are not belonging to me, but I see them as somehow pointing inward towards the self as the perceiver and knower of those things. Uh, Venerable, uh, do you see any differences? Yeah, you in, can come in. Yeah, you can come up there. Do you see any, uh, do you see or encounter any differences in understanding dependent origination in terms of twelve links and dependent origination in terms of cause and effect and inter interdependency yeah. in Pali tradition and in Sanskrit tradition? The Sanskrit tradition. Yes. Okay, the Sanskrit tradition is very, very, let's say, extensive with many different stages. So first, let me say that even in the Pali tradition, I think it's probably close to the speaker. Yeah. Okay, in the Pali tradition, usually dependent origination, when it's elaborated, it's elaborated by way of these 12, 12 links, 12 factors. But there is a formula that lies behind the 12 factors that we also find. Imasmin sati idang hoti imasupada idang upajati, which means when this exists, that comes to be. Through the arising of this, that arises. Um, and then when this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. So that is the, I call this the underlying structural principle behind all the specific applications of dependent origination. Um, so it seems that what has happened, particularly within the Madhyamaka system, and please, I'm not in any way an expert on Madhyamaka, <laughs> far from it, but I think what Nagarjuna has focused on in 
the Mula Madhyamaka Karikas is using the structural principle of dependent origination and then applying it to different um, different areas of discourse that were being explored by the Buddha schools of his time in order to undermine particularly, I think, sort of what underlies his critical approach would be the development of philosophical thought in the Savastivada school, the Savastivada Abhidharma, which developed the idea of trying to define what is the um, basic nature of a dharma, of a constituent of existence. And to define the nature of a dharma, they, they brought in the concept which is called svabhava, which means swa is self and bhava is existence. So it's self-existence, or some translators now use inherent existence. So this is the idea that when you analyze experience, you eventually come to a set of basic constituents, and these constituents exist swabhavato. They exist in terms of their own self-nature, their own inherent existence. And so Nagarjuna would have seen that to be a departure, a deviation from the Buddha's original notion of dependent origination, because it's ascribing some kind of subtle substantiality to dharmas. It's almost like, you know, you get rid of the Atman or the personal self, but now you're still working with a subtle notion of independent existence, but now it's ascribed to the constituents, to the dharmas. So Nagashina used the fundamental structural principle of dependent origination. When this exists, that exists, to critique and to under undermine the identification of dharmas with swabhava, with things that exist inherently or through their own nature. That's my understanding, I should say. <laughs> Don't take it as authoritative. So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank mm. to Venerable. I feel very blessed, mm. really. I feel that uh, some Arhata is speaking, mm. really. Thanks for that. Uh, I have small, just simple, uh, no question, curiosity. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, when uh, Ajit uh, uttered this Her Dhamma yeah. Hetu, so Shariputta, yeah. uh, I opened, yeah. Yeah, knowledge arise, yeah. and vision, and so on, yeah. you have mentioned. Same thing is uh, uh, described in Dhamma Chakra Sutta also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buddha talk about yeah, yeah. the suffering, no yeah. truth of suffering, then I open knowledge, arise, reason, and so on, are mentioned there. Yeah. I'm very confused, you know, uh, whether these five have any stages, or uh, what is the difference? Like, I open uh, knowledge, arise, reason, arise, wisdom, and light. So, because Buddha have linked with the all four noble truth with these, you know? yeah, yeah, is there yeah. any stages like in Mayana tradition we trade like there is a uh, accumulation stage, preparation stage, yeah, senior stage and so yeah, on. Yeah. So such kind of interpretation in Pali text or not, one thing I would like to know from you. Yeah. Is there any difference? Okay, first those five terms that he used, the Buddha used when he discovered dependent origination, and then in the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta he uses them in relation to each of the Four yeah, Noble right. Truths. Right. Yeah, those, I take those terms to be just synonyms. They don't indicate stages of realization. So it's just different terms, all meaning the arising of Panya or, or, or Jnana. Of, the, of wisdom or knowledge. So he has the eye, it's like the eye opens, then there's knowledge, there's jnana, panya, wisdom, bija, yeah. is like say clear understanding, and um, aloko is light. Yeah, light. yeah, they're just, I take those to be synonyms for um, 
All synonyms for panya or jnana, for wisdom or knowledge. Just only emphasizing. Apart from yeah, that, it's, it's, this is sort of common, common in the early sutras is to use a number, it's like a string of synonyms just to highlight different aspects of something. But it's not distinct stages. Yeah, okay, as for the five, those five stages, I don't find those explicitly mentioned in the Pali suttas, but I believe that was sort of used, and we don't even find those five stages in the Pali commentaries. So I think that was, a, I would call that an interpretative device that was brought in probably in the Savastivada school, the Savastivada Abhidharma school. Because I know one has the, finds those in the Abhidharma Kosha. So that's the stage of preparation or accumulation and the stage of prayoga, what do you yeah, call it, yeah. intensive effort, the stage of dasana, Dashana, then the yeah, Bhavana, and then no more than a Seka, a Seka. Yeah, yeah, one finds definitely in the Pali Abhidharma, but there is definitely a distinction between Dasana or Dashana and Bhavana. So it's said that there are certain defilements to be eliminated by Dasana, by seeing. Seeing is the first stage of the four stages of realization. But then after eliminating, these are like the coarser cognitive defilements through seeing, then there are the stronger, subtler, um, emotional-based defilements, and also ignorance that have to be eliminated by bhavana, by the development of the path. But definitely I would say the distinction of accumulation and intensive effort, it makes sense. Though one doesn't find the terms used in that sense in the early suttas. Yeah, and and the small question, yeah. not question, sometimes I feel very much contradiction kind of, you know, when Tathagata Buddha attained the enlightenment, yeah. so he was completely silent, yeah. he uh, didn't wish to yeah. give teaching, you know. Yeah. So in order to teach, yeah. you know, yeah. Brahma yeah. Uh, need to be uh, yeah. request. It seems that Buddha doesn't have like compassion compared <coughs> to the Brahma. You know, yeah. if we take this yeah. as a literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, that's a very <laughs> interesting passage, and I've thought about that a lot because I accept the idea that the person who became the Buddha would have followed the Bodhisattva path through countless <laughs> past lives with the aspiration to become a Buddha to. <coughs> spread the Dhamma throughout the world. So now he achieves finally his goal, and he thinks, no, too difficult, can't do it. <laughs> so this is my personal understanding. If the Buddha attains enlightenment, and then on his own initiative goes out to start teaching, it's sort of like, if I could use an American expression, like he's trying to lay his trip on other people. So he has to wait for the world, in a sense, to respond and it plead with him, please teach. Then it's like the Buddha is accepting the request of the world. It's not that the Buddha doesn't, that his compassion is dried up and he's really, <laughs> he's really going to keep silent and not teach, but it's, he knows probably that this is the fixed sort of niyama, like this is the way things work. I have to keep silent until the world represented by yes. Brahma comes and asks me to teach. And I know the Pali commentary also says that in India at that time, Brahma was worshipped you know, by, <clears throat> by the people, especially the Brahmins. So then if people hear that even Mahabrahma has come and has asked the Buddha to teach, then there must be something very special in this Dhamma. <laughs> no, seriously, I think that's the case. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming here for us. Yes. So, uh, my question should be the same. With his question. So, uh, I would like to know whether uh, 
The all things or all phenomena are described as dependent origination in Theravada Buddhism or not. If they are described as uh, dependently originated, uh, uh, I mean, in Theravada uh, Buddhism, then um, the 12 links should be the only ways to uh, describe the things are the dependently originated or the uh, the some other ways to describe that things are the uh, dependent originate. Okay. Okay. Uh, as I said before, that there's the fundamental principle, the structural principle of conditionality, that when this exists, that comes to be, with the arising of this, that arises. So that principle can be used and applied in many different areas. Um, in fact, and we find in the suttas, the Buddha uses that kind of principle. In, or he, he applies that principle in different areas. When he's expounding dependent origination, it's used formally, sort of explicitly. It's usually done in terms of the 12 links or variants on the 12 links. But in other areas as well, the Buddha uses this inquiry, what when something, when he wants to deal with a particular problem, he raises the question like, what is the condition for this? Why does this occur? And then he'll investigate the condition for this. For example, to take an example, there's even like a kind of social application of dependent origination. These are called sometimes the 12, uh, nine things that originate from craving. So he starts off with the problem of social chaos, disharmony, and conflict and violence that we find in society. Then he raises the question, why is there this conflict, violence, and disharmony in society? Then he comes to one condition. Then he says, what is the reason for this? Comes to another condition. I don't remember all the conditions, till finally he traces it back to craving as sort of the most fundamental condition. Then he continues, when there's craving, then there's this, when there's this, then there's that, and so on, till in the last stage, because of this, there is killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, violence, conflict, and disharmony in society. So that's like one other application. Another application of dependent origination would be in relation to, say, the five hindrances these are the obstacles to meditative development. So the Buddha will inquire, okay, the first hindrance, sensual desire. What is the condition for sensual desire? Ill will. What is the condition for ill will? Dullness and drowsiness. Restlessness and remorse. Doubt. What is the condition for that? How does that condition arise? How is that condition eliminated? How is it prevented from arising in the future? And then with the enlightenment factors, the opposite, what is the condition for each of the enlightenment factors? How do we create that condition? How do we strengthen that condition so that the enlightenment factors reach maturity? One finds this in the Satipatthana Sutta, in, in the fourth Satipatthana. So even though the text doesn't say this is dependent origination, but we could see that this is an application of the principle of dependent origination. Just I want to uh, know that uh, you described the Anadlakan Sut. Yep. And uh, in uh, Mahayana also had the second Dhanjaka uh, Pavatan is the same the Shunita Sutta, Prajapamita Sutta. Can you describe a little bit these two Sutta? Which? Anadlakan Sut and uh, Prajapamita Sutta. Yeah. It's a bit different, or some similarity also. <laughs> because the Buddha's second uh, sutta is another kind of you describe. Yeah. And uh, in the Mahayana tradition, yeah. the second Tamchakka is uh, Shunita, Prajaparmita Sutta, which is very similar. Yeah, and also the name of the singing. Yeah, the name of the same name. Same name. Yeah. Little bit. Yeah, I'm not, sure. Sure. I'm, not sure. I'm not quite sure I understand what the 
he's asking about uh, the, uh, the difference between the Anand Lakhana Sutra yeah. Yeah. and Pragya Bhattu and, and the, the Anand Lakhana Sutra in Bali, right? Yeah, Bali. And the, the Pragya Paramita Sutra, which is also known as the Sutra of uh, Anand Lakhana Sutra. Lakhana Sutra. So they have uh, pretty much this. I see. Do you find any similarity, commonality between those two? Because they both are describing uh, about the characteristic lessness of the uh, Yeah. Of course, there, there are like several Prajnaparamita sutras which are quite long. Some of them get to be, you know, 8,000 <coughs> verses up to 100,000 verses. Um, maybe let us take just what's called the heart of Prajnaparamita, um, Prajnaparamita or Dayatmaya Sutra. What's similar, uh, let's, okay. The Anatta Lakana Sutta, as I said, it uses two kinds of, call them arguments or rash rationales for the non-self nature of the five aggregates. The fact that the five aggregates conduce to affliction, that if we can't control them, and the second argument proceeds from impermanence to dukkha to suffering, and then together, what's impermanent and dukkha is non-self. Those are the two arguments. The heart of Prajnaparamita Sutra also uses the five aggregates as a sort of primary template, its original template, but it just begins with the declaration that the five aggregates are not different from emptiness. What is emptiness? That is the five aggregate. That is form. What is form? That is emptiness. And then from there it goes on to in emptiness there is no the rising, no cessation, no purity, no defilement, no increase, no decrease. Um, so, at least the Heart Sutra doesn't present the rationale for the emptiness of the five aggregates, but it proceeds to a sort of direct declaration that the five aggregates are empty. And this is why I say that what Nagajana, like, like his specific accomplishment, was to see dependent origination as the underlying ground for the emptiness of the five aggregates. So that would be a, a difference that in the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the Buddha is presenting a reasoned documentation for the non-self nature of the five aggregates, whereas the Heart Sutra seems to presuppose, perhaps we could say, a process of development may be taking place over several centuries that led to the formulation of emptiness as a core concept. And because that idea of emptiness was already sort of firmly established by the time the Prajna Paramita Heart Sutra came into being, a rationale for the idea of emptiness is not laid out in the sutra itself, but that became the task of the commentators on the Heart Sutra. Are you, when you say about uh, the, um, the form uh, formed on the river and uh, coming from far away, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that uh, the sutra, are you referring to the Pain of Thoma Sutra? Yeah, yeah, it's called the Pain of Thoma Sutra. Yeah, the simile of the lump of Thoma. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Now you have to come here. Yes. <laughs> Previously, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm in, my name is Tenzin Sonam. I'm an MPhil student of this generous university. So my question is valuable, uh, a kind of a general question. Uh, can you share with us few of few notable significance of compassion or bodhicitta, specifically in Pali tradition? Mm. Can you share with us few notable a significance? Few. Few. Notable significance. Notable, notable significance. Of bodhicitta in yeah. Pali tradition. Thank you. Yeah, it would be an interesting search to see whether the word bodhicitta is used in the Pali tradition. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, this I found, is that in the Nikayas, the emphasis is always on the attainment of arahatship. But 
over time, in the Theravada commentarial tradition, I think because later generations that are looking back in the, into the Pali suttas, and they're seeing that there are qualities that distinguish the Buddha from the Arahat disciples. And so, over time, the Pali tradition begins to fill in, in greater detail, a conception of a bodhisattva path which we don't find in the Nikayas themselves, not explicitly, until by the time we come to the sub-commentator, Dharma, Dhammapala, from Kanchipura, he actually develops a full treatise on the Bodhisattva path, which begins, the Pali tradition, it doesn't use the word Bodhicitta, but it uses a different term, which has the, si the same significance. It's called the Maha Abhinihara, which means something like the great undertaking. And this is what a Bodhisattva, a future Buddha, the way it's shown in the Pali tradition, is what he formulates in the presence of the Buddha, of, a, of another Buddha. Like in the case of the being who has become our Buddha Gotama, when he encountered the past Buddha Dipankara, then he bowed down at the feet of Dipankara, and he formulated this aspiration, this vow, may I in the future become a Buddha. So that is like his generation, generating of the strong bodhicitta. And then the Buddha, Dipankara, looks down at him, and then says, in the future you will become a Buddha by the name of Gotama, and such will be your chief disciples, and so forth. Okay, so what I would say, like, in this treatise on the practice of the paramis, we have the conditions for the arising of that great aspiration, that great vow, and, like, the main condition is said to be the great compassion. And so the person who's going to become the bodhisattva, who's going to attain Buddhahood, forms that aspiration out of compassion for sentient, not simply out of compassion for sentient beings, but out of the compassion that will move them to undertake that long and difficult period of training over many, many lives in order to fulfill the paramis or paramitas needed to achieve Buddhahood. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable Bhikkhuvodhi. This has been quite enlightening in many ways. And uh, the, your uh, elaboration on dependent origination. Uh, in Mahayana tradition, we call it uh, the internal dependent origination and the external dependent origination. Mm -hmm. The internal de dependent origination is with re uh, respect to the Twelve limbs, mm. links, and uh, as you explained uh, <coughs> very well, that uh, the twelve uh, links of uh, dependent origination um, does not take place in one life, but then it takes uh, uh, either in two the minimum uh, course or in three maximum lives. Mm. This had you know. So I always used to raise questions for those uh, Buddhists who do not believe in rebirth. Mm. How you are going to explain this? Mm. Mm. So if this is the case, then how you are going to uh, explain and accept the pro noble truth, you know, you know Dharma sermon that uh, Buddha turned in Saranath, mm. the the origin of uh, suffering. Yeah. So yeah. when you go to the origin of suffering, then you have to go to the twelve yeah. links. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you are going to explain it. You get, you are got to stuck there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so therefore, it is very important to understand as a, you know, practitioner, how these twelve links of uh, dependent origination takes place. It is not simply to, to understanding intellectually, but to ask a question on ourselves. Why I'm here today, as existing as a person existing as a human being yeah. and uh, you know facing different kinds of sufferings yeah, nice. encountering different uh, uh, kinds of sufferings so all these existence uh, come from 
and then eventually, you know, from the, the, the existence, the clinging, and then you have the craving, feeling, how they go, you know, uh, come into existence, uh, um, having given rise to the previous causes and uh, you know, conditions. So these, and then the greatest finding, the discovery of Buddha is the, you know, the dependent origination. And that is uh, the dependent origination and the selflessness, which uh, on this earth, no, no philosopher has ever found this. And this is greatest discovery in order to, not as a dis discovery to, make some explosions or something like that, but as the greatest discovery to free ourselves from suffering. But if we just you know, engage ourselves intellectually, reading, reading and speaking about this, talking, but not to contemplating and internalizing, then it is not going to make any difference. But if we associate it with our life and then make this as our perspective, and then experience this uh, through our own um, the faculties, then we are got to, you know, see the realities. And the understanding of the reality, seeing the realities as it is, mm -hmm. that is a greatest finding of the Buddha in terms of uh, dependent arising. So either you may think from the perspective of uh, the internal uh, dependent arising, or the dependent arising in general, as uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has said that uh, idam sadi idam, idam bhavati, because of this that is there, because of uh, having given a reason to that, mm -hmm. this comes into existence. This is a fundamental kind of a philosophical statement made, made by Buddha, which is applicable in every respect, mm -hmm. every uh, entity, whatever they are. Either it is a compounded phenomena or it is non-compounded phenomena, whatever. So these uh, um, are certainly, and also there is uh, lots of, uh, there are lots of debates in uh, the Mahayana philosophical schools, mm -hmm. and uh, then um, particularly this debate has been going on uh, between the uh, philosophical schools of Mahayana as well as the among the Tibetan uh, Buddhist uh, schools that whether the dependent arising or selflessness should be uh, is to be realized at the subtlest level by all the, uh, the, the all the traditions who you know go through that uh, uh, process of realization mm -hmm. so at the, at the stage of darshana then one has to see and one has to perceive it mm. and realize it, not to realization uh, through inferences, but to realization, direct realization. Mm. And once we have this direct realization, then there is uh, the total eradication of the root of samsara, and this is possible only by the direct realization of uh, the selflessness or emptiness, whatever we say. and. Uh, and after that, uh, in the subsequent uh, path, then there are further kind of practices uh, that uh, keeps on going for the uh, elimination of the reminiscent afflictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the uh, realization of selflessness or emptiness, uh, which is uh, you know mandatory in all the schools mm -hmm. and. Uh, Master Nagarjuna has also said in his Mool Madhimika Karika that uh, that, that is, uh, you know, mandatory. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, um, the selflessness uh, in the context of a personal perspective or in the, in the context of a person or selflessness in the context of a, a general phenomena uh, are both uh, to be seen from the dependent origination perspective. Mm. So we are very grateful to Venerable and uh, this is your first visit and mm. first talk. <laughs> we are looking forward to uh, listening mm. from you mm. and to particularly you have translated uh, uh, many of the Buddha's discourses and, uh, uh, and some uh, prominent uh, 
the traditions uh, and sutras like Sanyuk Nikai and mm. uh, Machima Nikai. Mm. And Machima Nikai is the uh, content of Machima Nikai is a very favorite uh, yeah. for me. Yeah. So therefore we would like to hear from you in future mm. when you visit next time. Thank, yes. you, so much. thank you very much. And I also thank our visiting professor, Venerable Simule, uh, who is teaching here, um, giving a course on Pali, uh, uh, yeah, Pali um, and Theravada Buddhism, uh, giving um, uh, a course uh, of uh, um, the diploma. So he has been associated with us for the last uh, many years. And I thank you for giving us the information and bringing him here with us. Thank you very much. So we have, uh, as a chef, token of our gratitude, we have uh, uh, the, the, some uh, scroll paintings and uh, souvenir. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you very much.